Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Happy Memorial Day. Glad to see you guys came in today. Well, we are continuing in our series, Families Are Messy, and we've been looking in the Bible at the patriarchs of our faith and looking at how they handled some of their relationships, and we've been noticing they have a lot of messes like we do today, right? And so I want to take and shift our attention today to the impact of our family of origin plays on us, okay? And so we're going to look at that aspect. But would you bow your heads with me? And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit just to be coming more uh, present here. Thank you, Father. Lord, I ask that you would wake us up. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill every nook and cranny of this, uh, th th this auditorium, Father. And Holy Spirit, all that we say, all that we do, may it give you honor and glory. For you alone, Father, are worthy of that. And so come, Father, and use your word to illuminate the path that you want us to walk on. Come and be Jesus. Come and be what we need today. Amen. Amen. So in looking at this family of origin, I'm going to suggest that we go back to our ancestry, right? I'm going to, because we're all connected if you go back far enough, right? So I want us to go back to our ancestry. I want us to go back to the original family, the original one that we're all part of. And I want us to look at it so we can become crystal clear on how that, uh, how that plays into our humanness and some of the things that impact us, especially relationally. So I want to look at the fears that we inherit from that relationship. And uh, so it's going to cause us to go back and to have to look at the original couple that we all descended from, which is Adam and Eve, okay? So that's where we're going to go to our study today. And to do that, I want to catch, I don't want to assume everybody knows everything, so I'm going to catch you up, right? So if you were to go to your Bible and you were to open up your Bible, in the very uh, first part of it, you would see Genesis, right? And in Genesis, what we see is God creating the whole universe. That's what he does first. He creates the whole universe. And why? Does he create the whole universe? So that he can create earth. And why does he create earth? So that he can create an environment that would be suitable for human beings, right? So why does he do that? Why does he create that for us? Because God wants a family. That's why. God wants a family. And so he went to the extent to create that environment for us. And that even from the very beginning, he desired for us to come and be part of his family. Right? So when you, fast, you go forward with this, then we see God creating Adam. Right? And he put him in the Garden of Eden. And Eden is a perfect place. Has no... no uh, no, nothing bad, it's all good there, right? So Adam's in the garden, he's tending the garden there. And so what happens is he starts to realize that he's lonely, that he needs a mate also. And I believe God did this intentionally, by the way, so that he would recognize that need within himself. And so once uh, that takes place, then God answers that. So we see here again that God is creating Adam out of the dirt, right, of the ground. He creates Adam. And then listen to this. Out of Adam, he creates the woman. He creates Eve, okay? Now, this is very significant to me, so I'm going to pause for a second. The way this creation took place of Eve is, is very, uh, to me, is, it's very significant because it really speaks to us about the original intent of God uh, in relationships, okay? So what we see happening here is that Eve, she was designed to be Adam's partner, to be what the Hebrew word calls an Esha, 
a second half, an other half, right? And then she is to walk beside him, and she is to be the co-heir of the kingdom of God. And so this is what God's original intent was, and we see that when he takes the rib, because the rib wasn't like, like God didn't make Eve out of, the, uh, out of something out of the foot so that he could, you know, have it over, lord over her, nor did he create it out of something out of his, you know, his mind so that she would try to control that. No, 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 no. He took... He took Adam's rib right, right next to his heart. It's the greatest love story you're ever going to see. And so this is how God created them as the co-equal partnership that they should have, that they would walk together. And so that is God's original intent for the relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. Now, what we see is, again, we see God creating Adam, and he puts him to sleep. He takes his rib, right? And then when Adam awakes, he comes and he puts and presents Eve right before him in all her glory. And he goes, whoa, man, <laughs> this is cool, right? That's how you get woman, right? Yeah, come on, it's early in the morning, I know, right? But he was excited to be there with her. And he's, you know, he knows this is bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. So he's so excited. And this is the only and the perfect relationship that's created here, right? And they have this perfect relationship. There'll never be another one like this, but this is a perfect relationship at this point in time. Why? Because sin hasn't entered the world yet, right? And so there's no manipulation. There's no jealousy. There's no sorrow. It's just perfect. So now we take this perfect couple, and here comes the twist of the story. Satan comes in, and Satan begins to talk to Eve, right? And so he begins to talk to her, and he tells her a lie. He said, didn't God say that you can't eat of any fruit in the tree, you know, any fruit on a tree in the Garden of Eden? And then she knows that's wrong. We know that's wrong. The word said that, no, it was only one tree that she wasn't supposed to, they weren't supposed to eat from. They could have a limitless supply of all the other trees. It was this one they weren't supposed to. Why did God do that? I think he did that because love gives a choice. Love gives a choice, and so they had a choice to accept that, to love him and obey him or not. And so I believe that's why God gave him that choice. But we see here that when Satan comes and he challenges with that lie, Eve knows it's a lie, right? So here you go. She stands up to challenge Satan and says, no, that, that's not true. God said that, that there was only one tree that we shouldn't eat, but here's where Eve goes wrong. This is where it all goes wrong. She starts to add in her thoughts. And she said, not only can we not eat of it, we can't touch it. Because if we touch it, we'll die. Satan's got her right there. Because he's going to build on that lie. If you go back and look at scriptures, he builds on that lie. And he says, surely not. God's not going to kill you for eating that. Right? Now, Eve knows she's lying. She knows what she's done. So now she's thinking, oh, gosh, he's right. So now she's got him agreeing with Satan. You see this, right? And so while, they're, while she's got him, you know, she's thinking, well, maybe he's got a point here. Satan, who's clever, he comes in and he starts to tell her now, perhaps the reason God doesn't want you to eat this fruit is because he doesn't want you to become wise, right? Because in coming wise, you will be just like God. And so now we see that, that Eve does fall prey to this line of thought, and she takes it line, hook, and sinker, the whole thing, and she gets hooked. Now, today's, uh, today's message, I'm going to build up and out of Genesis 3, 6 through 19, which is rather long. I'll read it to you. You can follow it on the screens. I didn't put it on your outlines. Right, you can go back and look at it later. Uh, but here it goes. Ready? So Eve ate some of the fruit. Then she gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her, and he ate it. Immediately their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt uh, ashamed of their nakedness. Now, there was no shame up until this point, okay? So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Then they heard the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from God amongst the trees. But God called out to Adam, where are you? Adam replied, I heard you coming, and I was afraid. Again, fear is entering here. I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. Then God asked, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Adam said, you gave me this woman, and she gave me the fruit, so I ate it. 
Then God said to Eve, why did you do this? And Eve replied, the servant, he deceived me and I ate it. And so God said to Eve, because of her disobedience, right? There's going to be a curse here. So God said to Eve, you'll have great trouble in pregnancy and great pain in childbirth. And though you desire your husband, he's going to lord it over you. Power struggle enters here. Then God said to Adam, because you have disobeyed me and sinned with your wife, the ground will wa- w- that you work is now cursed. And though you'll get to eat from the plants you planted in the fields, you'll have weeds and thorns and thistles for the rest of your life. You'll have to sweat and work hard to get your food until you yourself will return to the earth that I used to create you. Now, this part here, I'm going to build the whole, the whole message out of this, what I just read. I'm going to take out, because what I see in here is I see there's a tons of spiritual truth, but there's some points I want to make about what happens to the relationship here. I see that our ancestors fell prey to these three fundamental fears that impact their relationship. Guys, that impact ours in 2017 is still impacting us, what we received from our ancestors. And it inf- interferes with our marriage. It interferes with our, the way we interact with parents and with our children, right? With our friends and at work with our coworkers. These fundamental fears, what they do is they create this problem that we have relationally. They have potential to do damage and to to destroy those relationships or at best to destroy their potential, what they could be. And so it is our job to become aware of this fact, right? And so that's why I've broken it into two pieces. I want to show you those. The first one is how family origins impact our relationships. I'm going to show you three of those. Then I'm going to show you some answers on how to deal with them. The first fear that we have that we got from the Garden of Eden with our ancestors was this. It's the fear of exposure because this fear of exposure makes me distant, makes me distant. Again, Genesis 3.10, now this is on your outline. God called Adam, why are you hiding? And Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. And so what I want you to see here is that Adam felt afraid. He felt afraid of what? Of being exposed, of being naked. He's exposed. And so his response is to run and hide, to distance himself from the Lord here. Now that's what fear does. Fear of exposure, it makes us want to have distance from people. And here's the truth. Many of us in this room, there are parts in us that we look and we don't quite like, you know, that we're, we're like, oh, I don't know if I like that. I, and I certainly don't feel comfortable with myself and I don't want other people to see that, right? So we keep them at distance because we don't want them to see those flaws, those mistakes that we have, right? Those things there because they might reject us. And so we tend to run and we distance ourselves from people because we don't want to be exposed, and I also notice in this, uh, this scriptures that I read that God called out to Adam and he asked him two questions. He said, where are you and why are you hiding? Now, listen, God asked him those questions not because God didn't know, because God knew the answer. So why did he ask those questions? Because he's given Adam a chance to be able to own up, right? To man up to be responsible for why he ran and hid. And so that's why God is asking. Now, the implications for us is that you and I, if we want to have our mind transformed in our relationships, then you and I, we need to to own it. We need to go forward and we need to man up and understand that maybe perhaps the relationships that we're in, whether it's a husband, wife, whether it's, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, or, or parents or bosses, we have to recognize that it's less than God's ideal. It's less than that. And so in order to be transformed, you have to realize and not deny where you're at now and that you can move forward. If you don't, you can never move forward. So first fear that was departed to us by our ancestors was this fear of being exposed and then our response is to be distant. The second one that we get from Adam and Eve is the fear of disapproval that makes us defensive. The fear of disapproval makes us defensive. Now, what I want you to see here is that they were running and they were hiding. All of a sudden now, we're going to move into defensiveness, right? Because there's, there's a feeling of disapproval here. Now, they go from excusing to accusing. 
And you can see that in the scriptures, and I call this the blame game, right? We, don't, we try to deflect it from ourselves. In Genesis 3.12, it said this. God said, did you eat? He's talking to Adam. Did you eat what I told you not to? And Adam answered, you gave me this woman, and she gave me the fruit, so I ate it, right? So really, it looks like Adam's blaming his wife, but really, Adam blamed God, didn't he? He's blaming God here. He's saying, <laughs> you gave me this woman. What can I do with her, right? It's, you know, she's like, whoa, whoa, and she's a temptress, right? It's the woman's fault, but it's really your fault because you gave her to me. If, hey, if you didn't give her to me, we'd be like this, right? <laughs> you and me, bro. Well, that's what's going on here. So Adam is blaming God, and he's blaming Eve for his his actions there. He didn't accept any responsibility. And ladies, we're laughing at Adam, but you know what? Eve did the same thing, did she not? When it was confronted with her, did she own it and take responsibility? Oh, heck no. In, Ge in Genesis 3.13, she says, this is what Eve said, the servant deceived me and I ate it. The blame game, it's your fault. It's your responsibility. It's not mine. It's yours, 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 and yours. We see that with Adam and Eve. And is that not what we see in human relationships? The idea of, you know, when we're in a relationship and somebody uh, challenges us, whether it be a spouse or a parent or a boss, you know, and we feel like any kind of disapproval, what's the first thing we want to do? Reflect, right? We want to shoot back and we want to blame somebody else. We want to attack them. This natural tendency is passed down to you. It's part of your ancestry. It's part of what's come into your life. So you need to be able to recognize it. If you do not recognize it, then you cannot get in front of it. Okay? So the fear of exposure causes us to be distant. The fear of disapproval causes us to be defensive. And here comes this other fear. I want to talk to you, the last one. The fear of losing control makes me demanding. The fear of losing control makes me demanding. So when we lose control, we start to want control all the more. And so we're trying to scoop it up and we become more demanding. We stop caring about people, right? We start becoming more bossy <laughs> and uh, you know, demanding that people do what we want them to do, all in hopes of getting control. Now, back in the Garden of Eden, we see Adam and Eve, they lost control, didn't they? Right? They get, they're getting kicked out of the garden. <laughs> they're gonna, their whole future is kind of cloudy now. Right? Their whole situation has changed, and so they're out of control. Now, watch it impact the relationship on what God pronounces is going to happen in Genesis 3.16. It says, you'll have yearnings. This is what God says to Eve. You'll have yearnings for your husband, but he will lord it over you. Okay, which is a power struggle. In other words, the relationship that you had, this perfect union, is no more. Now there's going to be domineering issues that are going to come and they're going to play and they're going to be hard. Okay, that's what he's saying there. And to me, this is the beginning, beginning of the whole thing between the, two, you know, the sexes, the war between the two sexes, right? Between men and women, between you know, husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends. It's this war that's existing. It's this fight that has to happen, that is happening for positional authority, it's the struggle. It's here, right? It's where the relationships are now going to a competitiveness instead of a cooperation. Now, I know you're like me, and we so desire to have the cooperation and not the competitiveness. We don't want to be fighting with each other. We want to be fighting together against all the world, right? And so how do we achieve that? How can that be? What do we have to do? Well, there is an antidote to those three fears that we talked about, that fear of exposure, that fear of disapproval, that fear of control, right? Those things that, that we fear, that we push back with, and that we're defensive, and we're distant, we're demanding, right? And well, I want to tell you that, but I thought of this movie that I just saw, uh, Beauty and the Beast, the new, new one. Raise your hand if you saw it. Oh, you guys got to see it. It's great, right? It's really good. So in this movie, because there's some of you that have it, in this movie, what it is, is there's a, uh, there's a beast, and he's in an enchanted castle, okay? He becomes a beast because he's unkind, and all these three things, these three fears are working in his life, and so he gets, uh, he gets cursed, and now his whole castle is enchanted, and Belle, she, gets, uh, she comes to help her father who's caught there, 
releases her father, but now she's caught in this enchanted castle. And so she's trying to help, right? And she's trying to uh, be kind, believe it or not, to the beast. And of course, he's nasty as can be. And so they have this conflict, and now she starts to struggle. How can you love somebody like that? And then the enchanted objects start to talk to her about how they, how they have overcome uh, the, the, uh, the fear issues that are at play in the beast. And I want you to see it. Take a look at this. So the antidote to when we're dealing with this, people that are difficult is love. That's what it is, unconditional love. And in this movie, we see the entran- enchanted uh, characters leading Belle to that conclusion, which allows her then to be able to give love to somebody that seemed unlovable. Now, I hadn't intended at first to show you this video, but I felt like in prayer that the Lord showed me or talked to me. He said, Sharon, there are a lot of people that are here today, and they have beasts in their life. They have people that are unreasonable, people that are harsh, people that are judgmental, people that, that are keeping them down, that are causing great pain in their lives. And so I brought you that to, to illustrate a point, but also I believe the Lord's talking that, yes, indeed, that love can conquer all things, can conquer those people that feel like beasts in your life. So in 1 John 4, 18, we see, Whatever God, wherever God is, there is love, there is no fear. Wherever God's love is, there is no fear, okay? And so you and I need to know, the closer we come to God, and when we come and we brush up against him, it helps us. If we're looking for help in our relationships, then we need to have God's love there. We need to have God's love. Why? Because perfect love casts out all fear. That's why, and it gives us the answer You see, fear and love cannot reside in a person at the same time. When love comes in, fear must flee. When fear comes in, love will push out. And so we need to know that. So how do we learn to walk in God's love? Well, I want to show you some daily practices that I do that are very helpful for me to remain in God's love and I think will be helpful for you. On your outline, if you flip over to the back side, learning to live in God's love. The first thing I'm going to suggest is that you daily... Every day you surrender my heart to God. You surrender your heart to God. That's what you're going to do first, okay? So that means every morning before you pop up and hit the road running uh, to do all the things that, are, you know, that you need to do, I want you to stop and I want you to remember or, or form a time when you can pray, talk to God, right? Why? Because that love, when it enters in, fear has to be pushed out. So all the anxiety that you're getting dressed and you're thinking of your day, anxiety wants to come in or insecurity or worries and all those things. Well, when you start your day with the Lord and you invite him in, then love pushes out all those things and it changes your perspective. In John 11, uh, no, Job 11, 13, 18, it says this, surrender your heart to God, turn to him in prayer and give up your sins, even those you do in secret, right? And then here comes benefits. Then you won't be ashamed. You will be confident and fearless. Your troubles will go away like water beneath a bridge, and your dark nights will be brighter than noon. Then you'll rest safe and secure, filled with hope and empty in worry. I want that. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I want that. That's, that's what I want in my life. And so we need to know when God gives us these promises, they always come with a premise. A premise is things we have to do in order to embrace those promises. So the premise here is that you and I, we need to surrender to God. That means every morning that we recognize his leadership in our lives, right? And then we need to turn away from our sins when we see him, and we need to be talking to him. We need to have this close relationship. That's where we find the peace. That's, that's where we find the ability to have confidence and no fear of living and not having shame. It's in spending time with the Father. Now, I'm talking in this like real personal relationship here, am I not? Yes. And there's some of you, you don't have that personal relationship. And I want to tell you that that's what God wants. And that's his end game is to come in close to him, to be part of his family. And so today I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray and ask Jesus Christ to be the leader of your life, to accept the salvation he offers you so that you can have this very close relationship with him. Without it, you can't because it's not about religions and things that you can do, but what has already been done for you. It's accepting that. Now, those of us that have asked Christ to to enter our lives, to be the leader of our lives, let's let him lead, right? Let him lead. 
You know, we have to make sure that we develop a atmosphere, a process of going to him on a daily basis, right? We need to know that we need to, to have that in our life. If we don't have that, we don't have the power to walk it out. So you need to establish that. For I've not followed the Lord for many, many years, and that is my practice. I have to. It's no longer an, you know, I get to, you know, or, or it's not, it, it doesn't, I don't feel like I have to do it because I have a check. I need to go. That's a very life bread of, of who I am and how I exist from day to day and that, that walk with him. So that's what he wants for each and every one of us. So the first thing is we need to have a surrendered heart every day. The next one is just every day I have to remember the way God loves me. You have to remember that God loves you. Why? Because the world beats the snot out of you, doesn't he? Satan uses the world to smack you down. And so you need to make sure you have activities and opportunities to remember how much God loves you and how valuable you are to him. Remember what he thinks about you, not what the world thinks and not what you think of yourself. But what does God think of you? And you need to bring those in and make those fresh in your mind. I put a couple of them down on your outline that you could meditate and think about. The first one is that you are completely accepted, that God completely accepts you right where you're at. You see, I understand that some of the deepest wounds that can happen to us, it happens when people reject us, right? And when we get rejected, uh, it, it wounds us deeply inside. And so a lot of times we're always fighting to get the approval of people, whether it be a spouse or a husband or um, a wife, or it could be your boss, you know, it, all these people, your parents, you're always looking to get approval for them to, re, you know, approve and, and to respect you, right? It's very, very important to us. And so we go after this thing, yet, let me tell you, inside how we internalize that is if I was perfect, if I was good enough, they would like me, right? That's what happens inside. Well, here you go. Jesus Christ was perfect in every way, and they crucified him. They are, you're never going to please everybody, and so you need to get that in your mind, and that can't be your major worry. You know, you can't be worried about, do I have enough friends like on Facebook, or does people, do people like my Instagram, right? You can't be concerned about what other people think. It can't rule your life. You see, in Titus 3, 7, it says this, Jesus made us acceptable to God. And so what he does here is he gives you the end game of your life. He says the only thing that really matters is what Christ did on the cross that made you acceptable to God, and you need to keep that in the forefront. You need to now develop uh, some kind of a, a system, a way of reacting where you go, my mantra is I have an audience of one. So I come and I prepare and I do my very best to come and share with you today, but believe me, what you, whether you accept it or not is not here nor there. The one that matters the most to me is what does my Father in heaven say about what I did? Did I do what he said? Is he pleased with me? Right? And so I have an audience of one. We need to run our lives like that. We need to have this audience of one, and we need to remember that we are acceptable before God. Another thing we need to continuously remember is that you are unconditionally loved, that you are unconditionally loved. And the two characteristics I think about this uh, in God, it, this unconditional love, is that it's consistent. It's always there. He's not fickle. Oh, today I like it, tomorrow I won't. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He's always there to love you. And he loves you in spite of you. And he loves you just because, and you can't stop him. You can't stop him. He loves you before you acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior. He just loves you. He has always loved you. And so we need to remember that, and that needs to make us walk in confidence. In Isaiah 54, 10, it says, My love for you will never, my love for you will never end, says the Lord. It doesn't have an end. It just keeps on going. It's unconditional, and I'm here, right? Now, so how do you take that and you walk it out? Well, again, when you walk this thing out, I know you're like me, and, and we tend to get our, our self-esteem from our work that we do or from the families that we raise, right? So we look to them to kind of give us our self-worth and to fill that love tank that we need. But you know, as I do, that if you use your work or even your family, and those are two good things, to try to fill that unconditional need for love, right, that, that, that tank, if you try to, try to put these things in, it doesn't work. You still have this hole inside. The only place that you can get unconditional love is from the Father. The only place you can get that is by spending daily time with him and being surrendered to him. 
Do you see that? Okay, so the next thing I think about often here is I'm totally forgiven. I'm totally forgiven, and I need to remember this, and you need to remember this. We hear it, and it hits us in the head, but does it actually drop down into our heart? Isn't it, to practice it, very difficult, right? To practice the whole idea that I've been forgiven and I can forgive others, it's hard. Like, I was thinking about this, and uh, I'm gonna tell you a story. I'm not real proud of it, but I'll tell it to you, <laughs> okay? Right? Well, I was thinking about a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Andy and I, we were sitting having a discussion that was getting louder and louder, right? And so I think I was losing the argument. I don't know. But I decided, because I've been married to him for almost 30 years, I know where his buttons are, right? So I decided to push one. Boop. I pushed it. I knew what was going to happen. I stood back and I watched for the reaction. And sure enough, fireworks. You know? And I stood there and I was like, hmm. So then when the fireworks happened, I thought, okay, now I have to, we went and we both retreated to our corners, right? So I'm sitting there, yeah, right? And so I was sitting there, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit got a hold of me because I'd spent time with God that morning. And what are you doing? So now, ah, oh, why did I do that? I don't know why I did that. Oh, I know why. It's his fault, <laughs> right? Blame game. It's his fault, Lord, the man you gave me. <laughs> Ancestry crap coming in. And so, you know, I started to go down that way, and then I caught myself, and I said, no, no excuses. You did this because you're a sinful woman, period end. Now what are you going to do with it? So, you know, it caused me to dialogue with the Lord. When I was dialoguing with the Lord, and I said, God, this is what I did. Forgive me. And he's like, sure, Sharon, I love you. I'm going to forgive you. And then I said, well, what do you want me to do next? He said, I want you to go ask Andy's Apollo, you know, ask him to forgive you, that you're sorry. I was like, <laughs> God, it's easy to ask you because you're unconditionally loving me. Andy has conditions, so do I, for my love, right? So that was a harder one to do, yet I knew the Father was asking me to do it. So I said, well, if you empower me, I'll go do it. And sure enough, I went and owned my part and said, I'm sorry. And he goes, yeah, that's kind of stupid, wasn't it? Let's go for a bike ride, right? So God takes care of it. He takes care of us. And uh, we just need to know that his forgiveness is enough and we can pass it on. In Romans 8, 1, it says, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. So we need to remember that forgiveness is something that has been given to us. It's to be experienced, and it gives us freedom. Now, I just gave you three quick things that you could do, activities, ways to remember that God loves you, ways to think about those and act on them. Now, the last point I want to show you to be able to live in God's love is this one here. Every day I offer that same love to other people. Every day I make it a practice to offer that same love to other people, right? Right? The same love that God gave me, I'm going to give to other people. In John 13, 34, it says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Look at this. To love one another, love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Whew. So what we see here is it's not an opinion. It's not a suggestion. If you are a Christ follower, you need to be loving people. It doesn't matter how much they disappoint you or they've hurt you or caused you pain. You still need to love them like Christ loved you. You need to offer them forgiveness as Christ offered it to you. You need to accept them because Christ accepts you. You need to love them unconditionally because that's the way that Christ loved you. That is the commandment here. That's what it's asking us to do. Now, many of you know I just came off a ladies' retreat, and uh, it was wonderful spending time with our girls. But it was there that in that intimate setting that we really got to share our hearts. And some of the stories that I heard were just heart-wrenching. There were sad stories, right, of deep wounds that they had carried, some of the gals. And in hearing that, my heart just broke. But I knew that I would have to uh, pull them back over out of the emotional place they were in to a place where they needed to offer, uh, you know, forgiveness to the people that had done that. And every time that I said, well, you know, the answer is first we start with forgiveness of this person that would be met with resistance. It's almost like, well, no, I don't want to forgive them. They don't deserve that. First they have to do X, Y, and Z, and then I'll offer them forgiveness. Now listen, I'm sitting there, and I heard the story, and my heart is like, yeah, they do not deserve it, <laughs> right? But you see, I know the scriptures, and the scriptures say that we need to be able to love people, accept people, and offer forgiveness as Christ has offered to us. It is not an option. 
right? It is part of the healing process that God has designed when we find ourselves in a deep well, right, in a dark place. And so we need to do that. He has a different angle. In Romans uh, 15, 7, he says, accept one another as Christ has accepted you. Forgive one another. So what does that look like? Well, in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, he says, this is how we are to conduct ourselves in our relationships. And he says this, never Love never stops being patient. Love never stops believing. Love never stops hoping. Love never gives up. And so you see these nevers here. And to really grab hold of the nevers, get get an idea of somebody you don't like in your head right now, okay? And if they're sitting next to you, don't look, please, right? But just kind of get in your idea. Somebody that's really bothered you, somebody that you don't like, or somebody that's a beast, (laughs) basically, okay? You got that person, Now let's go back and look at this scripture again. Love never stops being patient. He's saying to you and me, that person that you have in your mind, that you need to continue to be merciful, that you need to be grace-filled in dealing with them. And even if they sin and they have problems over and over again, that you are to come back at it and you are to be patient with them as they are dealing with what things they're dealing with. The next thing says, love never stops believing. It never stops believing. This is our faith. It needs to be activated when we're dealing with these people, right, in these situations. That, that it needs to be able, the faith needs to rise up and say, hey, even though we're having a hard time or even though we're distant, even though we might not agree, I want you to know that God's working all these things out and my trust is in God. And so therefore, I, I'm walking with you. Do you see that? And then it says, love never stops hoping. It always hopes. So when you start looking at love, hoping, I know, and you know, that we hear stories about, I have no more hope, right? It's empty. Where do I get the hopes? You know, I can't manufacture it. No. Let me tell you the way I approach when I have a lack of hope in something. I run to the scripture, and I find the scripture that deals with the issue that I'm dealing with, and then I pull it out, and I read it, and I go, well, that sure is not happening in my life. (laughs) But I take it and I start to make it part of my prayer. I talk to the Lord about it. I bring his word to him. And in doing that and sharing that burden of hopelessness with him, all of a sudden what happens is we rise up and we begin to be filled with hope. And it's something that God does when we spend time with him. And that's how you can never stop hoping. And then the last part of this is love never, in, uh, love endures the worst. It never gives up. It never gives up. So you can, you can run for the wrong, long haul, and you might feel like, well, I've run out of rope here to climb, but God's going to give you a new rope, and he's going to give you the power to climb that rope because that's what God does. As Christ followers, we never give up because we follow God's lead, and God never gives up on anybody or anything. And so you just follow your Father, and he'll lead you to the place that he wants you to be, and the ending will be as he says so, and then he can put the peace of Christ inside of you. So... We look for ways to offer love to other people. Very important. Now, I've talked about the family of origin and how it affects us. It affects us down to our very core of our being and who we are. And we are like the generations that have gone before us, right? And that will probably come behind us. This sin, these fears will follow us. These patterns of destructive behaviors and relationships, they follow us unless... You and I stand up in our generation and in our time and decide it stops here. It's not going forward. That we challenge the family of origin that we've come up and out of. We search God's word. We find answers. And it's there that you're able to to defeat the enemy. And he can't come in. He can't destroy your families. You begin to operate in a power that you never knew by staying connected with the Lord and walking in his love. Now bow your heads with me, and I'm going to close this in prayer. Holy Spirit, I thank you for being here. And Father, I know and I admit that most of our relationships are pretty messy, Father. They're less than the best of what you want, and they need to be transformed. And so, Father, would you change us? Father, would you come and would you, would you meet us where we're at? Those fears that we wrestle with, those fears of being exposed and and that wants to drive us to be distant from people. Father, would you come and would you heal that, Lord? Would you heal that that area, Father, where we want to be defensive? 
because we're afraid of the disapproval when we know that you love us, Lord. Would you come and do your work there? And Father, that fear of being demanding, Lord God, the control, I ask that you would break the control in the name of Jesus Christ, that we could be comfortable and sit down in your grace, Lord. And Father, as you had said, you said, lead them all the way to surrender, Sharon. So those of you that are in this room, let me tell you, the surrender is the only place that you can be filled with God's love on a daily basis. And surrender is not a one-time thing, but it's, a, it's something we do each and every day. So if you want to surrender yourself today, then you pray this prayer right where you're at. Whether it's your first time or your hundredth time, it doesn't matter. You just pray this prayer. You say, Father God, I want to surrender to you. So I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior. And I ask you, Jesus, to be the leader of my life. Come and lead me. Holy Spirit, take away all the fears. Let me know your love. Let me have the power to forgive. Let me have the power to, uh, to be able to know that I'm good with you, and that's okay, and I'm good. Father, breathe confidence. Now I'm going to pray for you guys. Father, I thank you that you seal those prayers in their hearts. And Lord God, with the authority that you have given me, Lord, I take down Satan in the name of Jesus. You cannot have any hold on these folks. No fear. Lord, would you just rip away the fear? Take it away, Father, like a veil. Just open it up. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would rain down in your power and in your might and that they would know a freedom that they've never had, Lord God, before. And then that would become explosive in all of their relationships and all the communities that you have put them in. Let them, Father God, be as a beacon on a hill that shines bright and which would draw all men onto yourself, Father God. Now I thank you and I love you, Lord, for all that you do and all that you are. And yes, Father, we will plead your blood over us and we will become like you in all ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com and we'll see you next week.